And hey there, everyone. Welcome to another Wide Open Talk show. Today is Monday, April the 18th. It is tax day in the United States. Normally, that would be the 15th, but uh, I honestly can't remember why they moved it. It's not because it landed on a Friday, because we've had tax day on a Friday before, but Whatever the reason, uh, today is tax day. So, uh, and joining me as always is my friend Samuel Lewis. Sam, how was your weekend? It was a great weekend. It was a busy and tiring weekend, but it was a great weekend. I even went to a Magic Ring meeting on Monday and met fantastic mentalist by the name of R- Richard Osterland. If if anyone wants to look him up, he's Fantastic. If you've ever seen a mentalist before, look him up anyway. He's he's got an extra style to him that I quite enjoy. So it was a good lecture and everything. So I had fun. <laughs> the only mentalist I'm aware of is the mentalist Patrick Jane on the Mentalist mm. television show. <laughs> Somehow I knew that was coming. Oh, <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, and, and not having met one in real life, um that show pretty much just proved that there was no there was no uh magic or real mystery behind it it was all about just watching people and and things like that so i mean Mm. we all know there's no such thing as magic right (laughs) yep put the wand down it's okay (laughs) i left mine up at my camper dang it (laughs) (laughs) all right well this is wide open talk show it is a call-in show so if you uh want to call in and weigh in give us your opinion on any of the articles that we'll be covering today, or if you just want to strike up a conversation, you got something you want to get off your chest, you know, within reason. I mean, we're, uh, we're, we're not licensed psychologists or psychiatrists, and we might actually tell you where you could go if you rub us the wrong <laughs> way. Anyway, the number is 229-518-3525, 229-518-3525. So I guess let's start off uh, today talking about how, uh, if you remember the tragedy that happened in Sandy Hook Mm. back in 2012, and honestly, I didn't realize it had been that long ago, but it, uh, it, it was, there was a lawsuit against the gun maker that made the, uh, semi-automatic, I think it was a rifle that was being used, AR-15, and The judge, Judge Barbara Bellis, ruled last Thursday that a federal law protecting gun makers from lawsuits does not prevent lawyers for the families of the Sandy Hook victims from arguing that the AR-15 semi-automatic rifle is a military weapon and should not have been sold to civilians. Um, (laughs) I, you know... Whenever I read this story, and granted, you know, there's no question that this was a tragedy. You know, Mm -hmm. there were 20 children and and six educators were killed in this shooting, and it happened in December of 2012. But the, uh, the, every, anytime I see anything like this, and, and, you know, there again, it, it was tragedy. But this is, this is like suing General Motors for producing a vehicle that didn't have enough safety features on it to keep somebody from getting behind the wheel after, you know, tossing back a pint or two and then killing somebody. Yeah, this this is the thing that hits me about this because it's a completely other argument whether or not these should go where or who or whatever. But the, the idea that it was sold to them... Um, that would be more of a thing for possibly the gun seller rather than the maker of it because yeah it's 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 a military like weapon and they make it they don't control who sells it i suppose is the best way of putting it right yeah pretty much pretty much and what what they're trying to say here is that <clears throat> Um, it says the lawyer for the families had argued that there is an exception in the federal law that allows litigation against companies that know or should know 
that their weapons are likely to be used in a way that risks injury to others. That, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. Because if, if you go by something like that, every weapon that is sold, every firearm that is sold can be misused in that way. Mm. So if, if that's a slippery slope in my opinion. Yeah, it could get very difficult very quick. But unfortunately, um, it looks like they're going to allow it to move forward. You know, I think they're going about it the wrong way. If don't, if you don't want AR-15 semi-automatic rifles to be sold, then you need to work within the system to get legislation passed and laws put into place that makes it illegal to sell an AR-15 semi-automatic r- rifle. And I know that we do have certain laws in place that prohibit the selling of certain types of assault weapons. Mm. I don't know if this is considered an assault weapon or not. Right. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm not a big gun enthusiast. I own some uh, mm. primarily because they were my father's whenever he passed away, and so I inherited them. Right. But beyond that, I mean, I used to go out and shoot with him and, and target practice and stuff like that. Um. Do I agree that, you know, it, it is kind of ridiculous for someone to have a a semi-automatic weapon where you can sit there and as fast as you can pull the trigger, you can empty a, a 15 or 20, you know, capacity clip or something like that? I don't think you really need that in the home. Mm. You certainly don't need it to go deer hunting. You don't. Because, <laughs> I mean, there won't be anything left of the deer. <laughs> you can use a freaking bow and arrow and get that job done. <laughs> That's right, you know. Make it a little more sportsmanlike and, and be a little bit more challenging. Get out there with a bow. Mm-hmm. You know, any Yahoo with a little bit of training can get out there with a rifle and kill one. Do it with a bow. I like <laughs> that. But, uh, yeah, I think they're just going down this. This is the wrong path for them to be heading down. It just it makes no sense to me, and I hope. not. I feel bad for the families. I do. But I hope that once this gets to court, that uh, a jury, you know, basically has reason, has some common sense and says, no, I'm sorry, you, <laughs> you know, please somebody come up with the analogy like I did with the car. Mm. You know, are we, are we going to start requiring all vehicle manufacturers to put a, uh, a breathing machine, a breath analyzer in the car before you can actually get in there for mm. everybody? I mean, mm. no matter who you are, whether you've had a DUI in the past or not, some would say that makes a lot of sense. I don't know. I think that en- encroaches on some freedoms. Mm. All right. Uh, talk about freedom. We have this mattress. <laughs> <laughs> it's called... Is, is this the ultimate in figuring out that you don't have a trusting relationship when one of these shows up? I guess so. I, I guess so. And, of course, what we're referring to is it's called the Dermot Smartress. It's a Spanish-made mattress that pings your smartphone whenever it is, quote, in use. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is an article on Recode, and they said, now, there are two ways you might market a mattress like this. You could skirt around the idea that this technology just might be used to snoop on the bedroom habits of suspected partners, or you could steer right into the paranoia at full speed blaring dramatic music while warning of a global infidelity crisis that knocks on your door. And apparently (laughs) the latter is where where (laughs) this company decided to go with this. Uh, The ad concludes, if your partner isn't faithful, at least your mattress is. Wow. (laughs) I... Oh, I... (laughs) Oh, goodness. It says this is kind of reminiscent of uh, 2009 whenever um, a guy supposedly rigged a bed to tweet whenever his n- newly wedded friends were having sex. And, of course, <laughs> that that was a prank about two people no one knew the identities of. Right. Whereas this is a $1,750 bed that is aimed at everyday people with some serious trust issues. 
Yeah, you'd have to have some serious trust issues to pay that much for a freaking mattress. I know. <laughs> uh, it says the internet has been predictably kind. This is the <laughs> stupidest, most useless thing humankind has ever made, quoted one YouTube user. Um, <laughs> healthy dose of skepticism that smart dress is not even real, but then they reached out via email. A uh, press representative shared a video that's on this site. Uh, as the bed was being uh, tested at a public event in Madrid. Um, company spokesperson Antonio Muno said Dermot is indeed a real business and has been making sleep-related items since 2012. It has 10 employees. They produce around 70 mattresses per day. He credited the infidelity crisis angle to the company's advertising agency gray spain so basically he's like we didn't do it we, it wasn't us it's the marketing department those chuckleheads will do anything yeah he said dermot has received several requests from potentially interested buyers but declined to share the exact number uh the first ones are still in the manufacturing process but uh commenters on product hunt pointed out you don't necessarily need a fancy mattress if you're trying to catch a cheater in your own bed just install some cameras Hmm. Or if you're worried about cheating, you're better off spending a thousand dollars or so for this mattress towards something else like, I don't know, private investigator or a drop cam or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Mm mm mm. Yeah, I'm sorry, but if I got trust issues. You know, if I if, if if I think my my significant other is is doing the deed with someone else in our own mattress, I'm mm -hmm. not spending seventeen hundred and fifty dollars just so that I can get pinged whenever there's activity happening on the mattress and I'm not there. Right. Uh, you know, there are definitely cheaper ways to do it. Set up a webcam in an inconspicuous spot where it can, you know, see the bed and. There, there's free software out there that you can run, and you you can access it over the web if you want. So that way you can, and and it'll record based on movement. I mean, there's a lot cheaper ways of doing this. Or oh yeah, or get out of the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for one of us to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Just get out of that relationship. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah. All right, so we knew it was bound to happen at some point, but here we have the uh, British Airways pilot is reporting that a drone strike uh, happened. Not as in a strike like military drone, but um, the plane hit something Sunday afternoon as he was... Uh, I think he was trying to land. It says an object believed to be a drone struck the front of a plane landing at Heathrow Airport from Geneva, Switzerland around noon, according to London's Metropolitan Police. The flight landed safely, of course. Uh, no arrests have been made, but the Met's Aviation Police warned that flying a drone too close to a plane is illegal. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> They've got, uh, I guess these are tweets. It says, officers are currently speaking to a pilot who has reported a drone flying very close to his aircraft on approach to Heathrow. This is dangerous. It's also a crime. Please be aware of the rules before you start flying a drone. The plane had five crew members and 132 passengers. It was an Airbus A320. So, um, British Airways said in a statement that the plane was inspected and cleared for the next flight. So, yeah, don't fly your freaking drones near an airport. <laughs> what? What idiot? Just, what? <laughs> I'm not even going to be nice about this one. What idiot flies a drone near a... near a place like this? What the heck? <laughs> I know. I mean, it's about as ridiculous as... Those yahoos that thinks that it's kind of cute and fun or whatever to uh, beam a laser, you know, up at a plane. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you bring a plane down and you kill a couple of hundred people. Yeah, 
you won't feel so so much like a smart ass then, will you? <laughs> yeah. But you know, I'm I'm a lot of the things that I've been reading lately has pointed out that most things in our world is actually designed for people with a middle tier to lower tier IQ. <laughs> And what do you expect for someone that probably has an IQ of 100 or less? <laughs> yeah, I, do, I don't even know what the... I know that the FFA over here has started making some guidelines when it comes to drones and stuff like that, registration of a certain size, things like that. I don't know what sort of laws they have over there with the setup. Yeah. Because it's obviously a different agency. Well, so. that's true. That's true. And I think they're probably very similar to, to here. Um because the FCC started that back over here, not the FCC, the FAA uh, started that back here around Thanksgiving, I think, and you had a certain time uh, around December twentieth or something to get your your uh, your drones registered. Now, yep. I've got a couple of the little, like, really tiny, small drones. I mean, they might weigh four ounces, right? But so you don't have to register something like that. Yeah. But those bigger units that cost a couple hundred dollars actually have the cameras on them and all. Yeah. I forget. I think it's like a pound and a half or three pounds or something. I, I don't something really like remember. That. Yeah. All right. So raindrop cake. I know you're a, you're mm -hmm. a foodie. I am. I have so, admitted as such. <laughs> that's right. Um, this is something new. That, yeah. And this is something I had not heard about. Yeah. Uh, apparently it's trending in New York. Um, 36-year-old Darren Wong said, um, well, you know, what is it? It's a cake that looks like a gigantic uh, raindrop. Mm. Now, he is a senior strategist at 360i, and he told ABC News that the raindrop cake is inspired by traditional Mizu Shinjin Moki from Japan, and I probably just bastardized that. <laughs> but, uh... It says, while the raindrop cake creator isn't a trained chef, it turns out that his love for baking runs in the family. His dad apparently was a baker, so he's been around it his entire life. So it's made out of, and you said you had already heard of this agar. Yeah. But it's made out of natural spring water agar, which is a vegetable substitute for gelatin, and topped with a black sugar syrup called kurumitsu. And, ro and a roasted soy flour called Kineco. Um, kind of looks good. Mm hmm I wonder if I can find those things. Now, they, um, it said it made its uh, debut in the United States last week at Smorgasburg, an outdoor food market in Brooklyn. Apparently, it was an enormous hit because he had 700 raindrop cakes and they sold out. Wow. And they were selling them for $8 a piece. Mm. Which I don't guess is too bad. I wonder what size it is, though. That's the thing. Yeah, I know. It's a bit difficult to tell with the pictures, right? Whether it's small like that or, or a bigger cake. that it, I can't tell. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you look at the picture at the top of the article... It's not, I mean, you can see the size in relation to that spoon. Mm. And, of course, the fingers on the spoon. So you can kind of get an idea. You know, is that going to be the size? I mean, I would think this thing has got to be in some kind of container. Well, if it's if it's already set with the agar, then it's got a shape, yeah. right? Okay. So it just makes it look like a raindrop right which is neat it, it looks like a dewdrop just sitting yeah. there waiting for i mean if i walked up on it and i didn't know i wouldn't know that it was edible right yeah <laughs> just looked like a big blob of water yeah or something else that i might not want to partake of <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah it's kind of neat mm. but, so i guess you can only get this in new york um that's that's going to leave me out. I'm not going to New York anytime soon. Yeah, me neither. So, <laughs> molecular gastronomy, it carries on. <laughs> yep. All right, so Kobe Bryant retired from basketball last week. 
play this final NBA game. So in the, in the spirit of Moronic Monday, here's an article <laughs> where people were trying to sell air from the game. Mm. Not Air Jordans or anything like that. We mean actual air. Like there are pictures of Ziploc bags and something's written on it says Kobe's final game. Mm-hmm. A bag of air from Kobe Bean Bryant's last game. A thousand dollars or best offer. <laughs> they said that one started out at a dollar and went all the way up to fifteen thousand before it was taken down. Dang. Fifteen thousand dollars for air, which you can't even prove actually came from number one, came from the atmosphere, if you will of you actually being at the basketball game. Number mm-hmm. two, like it pointed out, even if you could say, okay, I was there. This is air that I collected while I was there at the game. You can't you can't prove that that's Kobe Bryant's breath. You know? Right. Yeah, there's a whole lot of other people there too. <laughs> yeah. And... You know, you got to look at the uh, the air conditioning system, the exchangers, how many times per minute or whatever that the air actually gets changed out in a venue like that. Mm. So this, why do people even bother doing crap like this? This is just ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, that's like selling Jesus toast or something. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> or, or. Oh my God! My toast has got a picture of Justin Bieber. Five hundred dollars. That actually makes it worth less money. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's some believers out there that would go for it. <laughs> <sighs> okay, craziness. <laughs> Absolute craziness. Now this article. I'm just going to kind of skim over it a little bit because it was uh, it was interesting, but you kind of have to take somewhat of a deep dive and and really understand linguistics somewhat. Mm. But uh, it's over at uh, Nautilus. It's concerning dolphins are helping us hunt for aliens. A little information I did not know, but back in 1961, the Order of the Dolphin was born. This is when 12 men gathered at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia to discuss art and science of alien hunting. You had um, a number of the brightest minds, had three Nobel laureates, a young Carl Sagan, Mm. an eccentric neuroscientist named John Lilly, who was apparently best known for trying to talk to dolphins. All of them were in attendance. So the idea came about from Lily's research that if humans couldn't even communicate with animals that shared most of our revolutionary or evolutionary history, then he believed that they were a bit daft to think that they could recognize signals from a distant planet. (laughs) Which kind of, I got, you know, that gave me pause and I thought about it. And I went, well, I kind of see his idea. What he's talking about here is, you know, if we've got other mammals on this planet and we can't even figure out how to talk to them because they seem to indicate that they've got some form, function, what have you, some patterns to their communication. If we can't figure that out, then how in the heck do we expect ourselves to be able to actually understand radio signals that we intercept from outer space Mm. and so running along with that is how the order of the dolphin came about and apparently it's been something that's that's kind of gone in and out of favor over the years uh today it's back in fashion Uh, and the reason for that is because they've got new applications of information theory uh and technological advancements uh something called the Cetacean, I don't know exactly how you pronounce that. It's C-E-T-A-C-E-A-N, hearing and telemetry device, otherwise known as CHAT. 
which is a submersible computer interface that establishes basic communication with dolphins. And so they go through this whole complex thing about uh, the, uh, uh, the logarithmic um, findings of the way language works. Uh, this guy, this linguist uh, named George Zipf, I guess, is, it's Z-I-P-F, uh, from the 1930s. And they tried to do a comparison between the way human language stacks up to his his testing and dolphins. And then they, they also looked at a, let's see, it was a squirrel monkey and then a cotton plant, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> cotton plant. Hmm. But uh, they were doing, with the cotton plant, they were basically looking at the chemical exchange. Right. So the logarithmic slope of human language is negative one is the way it worked out. So then um, this guy, let's see, I think I skipped over it. His last name's Doyle. He's the one doing research on this stuff now. They plotted recordings from a group of captive bottlenose dolphins that had been observed from infancy, infancy to adulthood. And their resulting slope had a gradient of negative 0.95. So that suggests that dolphinese <laughs> may exhibit syntax. And the question was, why would such syntax exist? For one thing, this syntax enables the recovery of errors in the transmission, which definitely has survival value. A human example might be the recovery of missing letters in a poorly copied manuscript by the use of spelling rules. So that does kind of make sense. Mm -hmm. The squirrel monkey slope was never lower than negative uh, 0.6, meaning that the signals were too random to exhibit syntax. The cotton plant, which communicates through chemical emissions, had a sl uh, signal distribution slope closer to negative 1.6, meaning the signals were just too redundant. So all of that to basically say that uh, we need to pay more attention and learn to communicate with uh, the creatures in our watery alien world on this planet. Otherwise, we risk dismissing the first interstellar, interstellar hello as meaningless noise because we won't understand it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that has always been the one thing in all this stuff that I think about and go, well, now why in the world would we make the kind of cocky assumption, I suppose, that they would speak English? <laughs> but right? yeah, I know, right? Um, I mean, science fiction has done various things to take care of that, whether it be the Babel fish, the translation circuits in the TARDIS, or the universal communicator on Star Trek. You know, they, they, all these things have to deal with this question eventually. Or you deal with Star Wars that doesn't deal with the question at all and just assumes people speak all these languages and we get translations at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> I like the way Farscape ha <clears throat> handled it. You are injected with uh, nanites. Ah, and it uh, uh, the nanites actually, uh, I guess they would go up and either attach into certain areas of the brain or um, the eardrum or whatever, but it would uh, translate on the fly for you. Mm, neat. Yeah, because in the very first episode when, uh, oh, dang, I just forgot his name, um, John, I think is his first name. Anyway, Crichton, yeah. Whenever he winds up on the on the ship after going through a wormhole, you've got these little little small roving robots that go around, and one one just rolls up to him and then like stabs him with a, a hydra spray, <laughs> and he's like, "Ow!" And then suddenly, the creatures, the the other alien life forms that were on the ship, went from speaking, you know, in a foreign language to he could just suddenly understand them. So that's that's the way. They they utilize that device as a way of making sure everybody could understand everybody in the show. Mm. But yeah, it it does make you think. It's like okay, look at look at all of the languages that we have just on this planet, right? And how exactly? And granted, I know we go back to like uh, uh, Spielberg's movie back in the seventies. Um, that I'm just now drawing a blank. 
what is it called? The one that's got the musical tones. Uh, Close Encounters? Yeah, Close Encounters. You know, so we have to we have to come up with some universal universally uh, acknowledged and understood patterns like musical notes, mm. you know, something like that. And so some would argue that that's the reason why we'll probably never discover any alien life is because we simply won't be able to to understand them. I don't Fair know. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the original story about texting in the theater has been updated. Uh, the CEO, Aaron, I mean, Adam Aaron, had made statements about uh, potentially allowing people to text while they were in the movie theater and watching the movie. Now, I don't go to the movies. Uh, the last time I went to the movies is I actually saw uh, the, the third Star Wars movie. Um, so that gives you an idea of when that was, 2000, what, three, four, something like that. Yeah, something like that. So I don't even go to the movies. But even if I did, the last thing I want is someone texting on their <laughs> damn cell phone during the movie. Totally. And apparently they got so much backlash that he's now backpedaling on his statements. And because um, it says, following a social media outcry from moviegoers, the new head of AMC Entertainment said in a statement released AMC guests on social platforms that there will be no texting allowed in theaters, not today, not tomorrow, and not in the foreseeable future, he promised. No texting at AMC. Won't happen. You spoke. We listened. Quickly, that idea has been sent to the cutting room floor, <laughs> AMC Theater's official Twitter account wrote. <laughs> and the idea was this. It was not that we would be texting in every showing of every theater. The idea was that there would be text-friendly showings. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what some people didn't quite spark on. I mean, we were we were sitting there watching the Daily Tech News show. Me and Mom were, and as soon as this idea came out of the out of the headlines lips, Mom became hostile. <laughs> I've never seen her become so angry so quick in all my life. It's like I don't want people texting in a movie. Yeah, <laughs> so I, went, I went calm down. Calm down, let Tom be, you know. <laughs> and what was hilarious, even Tom was having problems being calm about it. It's like, I know I have to be all calm and everything, but I, I really don't want to about this. <laughs> you know, so it was it was beautiful. But no, it was it was just considering text friendly environments. It wasn't the whole kit and caboodle, as it were. Yeah. I mean, it didn't help him either that one of the statements he made was when you tell a 22-year-old to turn off the phone, don't ruin the movie, they hear, please cut off your left arm above the elbow. <laughs> you can't tell a 22-year-old to turn off their cell phone. That's just not how they live their life. Thank you for being a stereotypical jerk. I, I'm sure that really helped your case. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, could you sound any more old man? Could you really sound any more old man with, with a statement like that? <laughs> I know, right? Oh. Yeah, I... I guess he was trying to appeal to uh, a different, younger demographic. Mm. And and I realize that we, we in, are in the day and age where we have the whole second screen experience. Right. You know, you can sit in your living room, uh, you can watch a television program, whether it be Gotham, Flash, Arrow, or whatever, and people will be out there tweeting about it. I mean, William Shatner has been notorious hmm. for, for tweeting during these shows. I mean, and he's not even on them. Right, yeah. He just does it because he likes it, and, and people apparently love being able to sit there and see what Shatner has to say as they're watching this, this television program. And, and oh, of yeah. course, you know, there are other second screen experiences where the stuff actually, like apps actually tie in with a particular show and things like that. And I, I mean, that's cool. That's great in your own home. Yeah. But yeah. something like that is not going to work in a movie theater. And to me, allowing texting in a movie theater is like one step closer to that. Mm -hmm. 
I did hear someone, I, I was watching the morning stream this morning, as I always did, and someone in the tadpool, the chat room, for mm -hmm. those of you that don't know what that is, um, they made an interesting suggestion that had not been occurred to me before. If we were going to have text-friendly, which, of course, it's a dead, it's a moot point at this point, but if we were to have that sort of environment, why not make them set in the last two rows in the back? Hey. That way you didn't have to deal with them. They weren't in front of you, but those last two rows text roll rows mm -hmm. so those are the rows you can text in otherwise don't do it you know that would that would work i think the last person to deal with texting that i had uh i can't remember what movie it was the last movie we went to whichever movie that was um but there's this one dude sitting in the because we sit near the front of the theater we sit in those seats where there's it's the first row behind the handicap row where there's a bar with an area that's a gap. So if you're in a wheelchair or something like that, you can wheel yourself into position and be perfectly fine. It's, but we sit behind that area, that first row at the bottom. And there was a guy in one of the seats that was down there that, it, cause it's like two seats and then a gap, two seats and the gap is how it's set up. So there was a guy sitting in one of those seats and his phone was still on. Even after the guy stood in front of us and said to turn off our phones or use them. And so dad just, he did this so deftly. I was so proud of him. He didn't do it angrily or anything. He just leaned over and said, excuse me, do you mind that light's getting in, getting in my eyes? And the guy immediately shut it off and didn't turn it on for the rest of the thing. It's like, that is the most clever way I've ever seen someone deal with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is pretty cool. Hmm. Well, definitely don't care for uh, for texting. Or cell phones I mean, in, in a theater. I mean, it was someone trying to think outside of the box. It was this guy thinking, how can we make our theaters not the closed place that they have the reputation of being? He just got backlash for it. So I still at least give him credit for thinking outside of the box. Yeah, true. And and he just took over. He took over on January 4th of this year. So, mm -hmm. you know, new leadership, trying to make his own mark. Eh, let's do something new and in, in, in innovative no you bonehead that's not <laughs> the right thing to do yeah so all right uh kickstarter's biggest shit show <laughs> somehow got even messier <laughs> yeah i wish i'd found a better article title than that but it's appropriate <laughs> so this was now, this thing was awesome. I remember whenever this first came out, I looked over at Bob and I said, you know, we don't have parties, but. <laughs> <laughs> and this thing has, oh, let's see. It may be in the article, all of the stuff that is supposed to be built into this thing. Yeah, it's got a, um, a blender, a waterproof Bluetooth speaker, a USB charger, and a bottle opener. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All the stuff you need for an awesome party. Yeah. Right? And, and cool. 55 quart cooler. Mm, yeah. So it's a good size and everything. I could see using this for non-adult beverage situations and stuff like that, right? Um, so it wasn't just for your typical college party. This thing could have totally been used, but oh, it's it's having problems. It's having so many problems right now, and all of it's funding, right? Yeah. Which ever since... Um, Justin Robert Young and John Teasdale did their contender project and it funded properly. They were incredulously open about the whole process to where I've even got some more understanding of Kickstarters than I used to. Um, but to make a Kickstarter happen properly, you really have to do the math properly, plan ahead, even plan for things that you don't think will happen just in case. This is a clear cut sign of someone who did not do that planning properly, and now they're really paying for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. They uh, because they said that they've got uh, thirty six thousand Kickstarter backers, and now they're asking those people who have not received their coolers yet to pay an additional ninety seven dollars for expedited delivery. <laughs> but here's the kicker. You can go on Amazon right now yeah, and buy it for $399.99 and have it delivered in just a couple of days. Probably probably uh, falls up under Amazon Prime. 
<clears throat> because they said that initially, uh, whenever they uh, launched it on Kickstarter, it cost between one hundred and sixty-five and two hundred and twenty-five dollars, which is apparently a price that the creator, who is Ryan Grepper, mm-hmm. said to in an update to his backers, it was it was just far too low. And then they had a blender motor strike in China. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think you were allowed to uh, to strike in China. I thought if you strike in China, they kill you. <laughs> but the more you know, <laughs> yeah, the more you know. So yeah, um, he wrote in an update. Unfortunately, we didn't set the pledge levels high enough to cover the final quality of the coolest cooler. Mm. And this isn't the first one to have this kind of issue. The the Zeno drone also mm. had problems. And, you know, this thing got $13 million in funding, which up until that point, I think there has been another Kickstarter project that surpassed this one. But at the time, this was like the, the biggest one on Kickstarter ever. Yeah. And, and some of the comments on this page that they've been getting are ridiculous. They... They provided one of the lovely ones here, if I'll be allowed. I, yeah, I've got I've got it pulled up here, so I I can do the appropriate bleeping as necessary. <clears throat> this piece of <laughs> had plenty of money to make these. He, like every other idiot who gets rich overnight, doesn't know what to do other than spend. Now he figures he can suck more money out of his backers because it's only ninety seven dollars. If he could go, do it for 189, he won't do it for 97 more either. He answers no questions. Shame on anyone who gives this piece of more money. <laughs> I know. I know and pray he is a dead man walking. Ryan, you, you piece of. <laughs> I know and pray you and your family will die a horrible death, and I'll be happy knowing my $189 puts you in an early grave. Calm the heck down, dude. It's a cooler. <laughs> you can still have your epic parties because, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be that guy. I guarantee you this is a guy that gets drunk a lot. Okay? <laughs> I can't. I, I don't like being the guy that stereotypes someone like that, but this is a dude that is angry that he can't have an epic party. Guess what? Dude, you can still have an epic party without this cooler. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> oh. Maybe back away from the sauce a bit while you're at it, too. That might be helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to put the pint down, man. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, it says uh, last month, Grepper said the company needed another $15 million to deliver on the company's promises. And it looks like the company is considering asking its initial backers to pay an extra $97 to uh, fund each to fund production. Mm. <laughs> we would allow backers to pay for the remaining cost of their coolest to get it faster with a guaranteed delivery date before July 4th, he wrote. We are open to this option and exploring it here because you have asked us to do so. Yeah, people get, man, I don't know. I mean, people just get cruel. I mean, yeah, it's, it's one thing to be ticked off because, okay, they made some mistakes. Right. You've already paid $189. They're wanting you to pay another 97 But to threaten the man's life mm. just makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. And honestly, the biggest difference between this and that whole Zeno drone thing is Zeno actually went bankrupt. Mm. <laughs> they they went, we're out. We can't do <laughs> yeah. this. Yeah, totally. So this guy's actually still trying to deliver the coolers. He just uh, he just made some mistakes, and mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I feel for him. I wouldn't have bought the cooler anyway, but but that's right. just me. Yeah. I mean, if I really wanted it, I'd pay the three ninety nine <laughs> at Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, hey, speaking of Amazon, they have now added monthly Prime subscriptions, including eight ninety nine for video only. Take that, Netflix. 
<laughs> so if if you've been living under a rock for the last couple of years, Amazon Prime is, of course, started out as $75 a year. Then they raised the price to $99 a year where you can buy items off of Amazon.com and many of them uh, qualify for Amazon Prime shipping, which is free two-day shipping. So you order it Monday, you get it Wednesday, depending on what time Monday you ordered it. Totally. And along with that, you get access to uh, to um, not everything on Amazon VOD or Amazon Video or whatever, but you get access to a lot of television shows and you get access to a lot of older movies, which kind of puts it in direct competition with Netflix because mm. you typically don't get, unless it's, you know, original content like Daredevil and, and other things like that. You know, Netflix is normally like older shows. Uh, it'll be like, well, for instance, they did a deal with NBC for The Blacklist, which ticked me off because The Blacklist mm. was actually on Hulu last season and had been ever since The Blacklist had started. So NBC or NBC Universal Comcast, I mean, you know, the corporate the 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 main company made a distribution deal with Netflix where Netflix would would be the only provider to get the blacklist. However, part of that deal was that it couldn't be on any other streaming service during the actual season and I guess beyond. Mm. So we like the blacklist, but I other than me being able to get one or two episodes down an alternate way, we haven't kept up with it because I don't watch television in real time. I don't have a DVR, nor am I going to get one. And uh, you just took away my option, so screw you. <laughs> now, that's not what this is about, but this this basically is, if all you want is the Prime Video, then you can pay $8.99 a month, which is going to give you unlimited movies and TV shows, including HD, Ultra HD, and HDR when available. If you pay $10.99 a month, you're essentially getting Amazon Prime without any discount mm -hmm. because it works out to $8.25 per month if you pay for it annually, which is like what I do. It's ninety nine dollars right. a year, so you save twenty five percent as a prepayment discount. But if you don't, if you're the kind of person that's like, yeah, you know, I, I want to soften the blow over twelve months, you now have that option, which you did not have before. Hmm. So, I think that's pretty cool. You've got Prime, don't you? We do. Yeah, we actually split it around here, so it's. It's quite literally 50-50, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we have it around here. And and stuff goes in and out of it. Um, I believe Amazon is actually the exclusive carrier of Doctor Who right now. So, oh, are they? Yes, because there was a big back and forth, and then suddenly no one had it. Now Amazon has it. Okay. So. Well, I knew that it had disappeared off of Netflix because there was that whole you know couple of months there where it was like, it was going to be pulled off of Netflix, and then at the last hour, they were like, nope, nope, we made a deal. And it's like, mm -hmm. yay, it's been saved. And then not less than 30 days later, it's like, no, it hadn't been saved. The deal fell through mm. kind of thing. Yeah. So I didn't know it was on Amazon. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least the new series. I'm not so sure about the classic ones, but the new ones, yeah. Now, curious question. You may or may not can really answer this, but if... If these alternative options had been available for you, would you have taken one of these other routes like the 1099? Or maybe even if all you're interested in is the television and movie stuff, the 899 per month? Or would you have still gone with the, the annual stuff? We probably would have went annual because it was easier to plan. And again, it makes it easier to split up that way too, unless we suddenly went through this thing of, okay, I'll pay the 10 this time. And then as soon as we get there, then I'll, then you'll pay me the 10. I'll pay. It's just, be, it'd just be more complicated. Right. 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 Plus you're saving money that way too. At the annual. So. Yeah, of course. It's just, sometimes it's hard to, uh, you know, when you're, when you're watching your budget, Mm. It's it's kind of hard to say, okay, I'm going to take a $99 hit this month, 
or I can just take a eleven dollar hit this month, but knowing that I'm going to wind up paying, you know, an extra twenty dollars more for the year or something like that. Yeah. So, I'm I'm just glad that they've they've got options now. I think it's uh-huh. kind of cool. That is smart because that ninety nine has probably stopped quite a few people from actually getting into it. So. The ability to do that $10 a month or even 8 if they just want the video because this is the first time they've even had the option to just have video. That's right. That's right. So all of those options, yeah, it's pretty sweet. I know that whenever they raised it from 75 to 99 there there was somewhat of a backlash. But mm. it's just like everything else. I mean, that's like Netflix. If you had been grandfathered into their uh, seven ninety nine plan uh everybody that was grandfathered into that uh found out that they went up to the nine dollars and 99 cent plan this month basically they were like you're you were you're only going to be grandfathered i think for like a year Mm. and the number of people that i see that when something goes up by two dollars a month (laughs) flip the crap out Mm -hmm. oh well i'm just not gonna get netflix anymore and i'm like really you you're gonna complain about two bucks I mean, now if it had gone from seven ninety nine to fourteen ninety nine, yeah, then, then I'd be with you right there. You know, I mean, I even I pay eleven ninety nine for Hulu so that I don't have to put up with the freaking ads. If I wanted to put up with the ads, it's eight ninety nine or nine ninety nine. I forget. I think it's eight ninety nine. And even still, with that, there are certain shows, specifically NBC shows. That when you go to watch it, they'll tell you at the beginning, this does not fall up under our commercial free. You'll get an ad at the beginning and the end. And I'm thinking, okay, because I I have to watch through the ad at the beginning. I don't have to watch the one at the end. As soon as those credits (laughs) start rolling, I hit the back button. I'm out of (laughs) there. So, uh, anyway, well, good, good on Amazon. I mean, you know, they, like Google, are trying to take over the world, so... (laughs) Um, you added this one. I mm-hmm. I've read through it real quick, but I is he is he making a movie or are they making a video game? I couldn't figure this one out. That's that's the weird thing about this. So what we're talking about is that um anyone that has played the Bioshock games knows the name Ken Levine. Um, he was the main one behind them. He wasn't there for the second Bioshock game, but in my opinion, they did just as well. Um, but then he came back for Infinite whenever that happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's anyone that's played through those games knows the sort of brain that is in Ken Levine's skull. Um, the sort of brain that can come up with those things that twist reality a tad and things like that. Um, so apparently there is a Twilight Zone interactive movie that is going to happen, and Ken Levine is in charge of that movie. Um, and they keep calling it an experience. It's 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 more me being fascinated that someone is doing this and it happens to be Ken Levine than anything else, which is makes which makes me want to talk about this because I'm a huge fan of the Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the box set and we have we've been slowly going through it. Of course now all the shows are on television again, so we've gotten in a pause in that again. <laughs> That and when you're stuck on the season where they experimentally went for hour episodes instead of half an hour episodes, you can't pop in and out as easy as you used to be able to. (laughs) Um, Once we get through that, then it'll be easy again because then it'll be back to 30 minutes. We're almost through it. Uh, But but no, as a fan of The Twilight Zone, if you were to tell me they were going to make an interactive movie, I would be nervous. Keyword is would be nervous, and then you put Ken Levine's name on it, and I go, oh, well, I'm I'm excited then. <laughs> <laughs> because he really does have the sort of creativeness that could do something Twilight Zone-related justice, I think. Yeah, I honestly did not know who he was. I mean, I played Bioshock Infinite, and I really, I really liked it, but I had no clue who he was. Hmm. Yeah, I I tend to be the one of the two of us that sort of digs deeper behind to where I'm like, oh, who made this? Oh, it was a guy named Ken Levine. Okay, I'll just put that 
back now that I've dug into it, you know, sort of things like that. So, <laughs> yeah, they they mentioned something about this uh, interactive Super Bowl commercials, and mm-hmm. and I had no idea what it was. And they are apparently working real hard not to say the word VR. Chances are it's going to be some sort of virtual reality experience. But they are working really hard to make sure that that's not (laughs) what they say. So I don't know if maybe it's... Because there are VR experiences that involve not having a helmet. I mean, Discovery has an app for like iOS and stuff like that where you can totally move things around Mm -hmm. and not have it as goggles, but it'll still experience the accelerometer in your device and act accordingly. So you can still look around in a 360 environment. It's just like you've got a, oh, I don't know, a little dimensional window in your hand and you're having to look around to see what everything is. I, that's the best example I could come up with off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting what this experience will be because that's what they're calling it, the Twilight Zone experience. So it's... I don't know. Could it be something where it gives a lot of nods to the original? Could it be a completely new story that's under the Twilight Zone banner? We don't know. And we'll we'll just have to see. But it it does pique my curiosity at least, Ken Levine being in charge of anything <laughs> Twilight Zone. So Oh. Well, cool. I you know, I I do like the Twilight Zone, but I, I I was never like a, like, I just absolutely had to watch it all the time. But it, it was mm. one of those, in the Sci-Fi Channel, you know, several, at least once a year, maybe twice a year, we'll have a, uh, a Twilight Zone marathon. And yeah. th- this will be the old Rod Serling, black and white, up until the, the color ones. And, uh, you know, some of them occasionally will actually peak my curiosity or capture me and, and next thing I know I'm I'm sitting there watching the doggone thing. Yeah, there are definitely episodes that I run across where I go, Donovan would like this one. I need to tell him about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite ones is and I can't remember the guy's name, but it's about this this good old southern boy that t- it, he's and we've all run into one of these as both of us living in the southern region of the United States. That one guy that tells the tallest tales imaginable and everyone knows he's lying, including himself. Mm-hmm. And we just let him go on because it's the most entertaining crap you've ever heard, right? <laughs> so they took that character, as it were, and put him in a scenario where he told all of these stories well, you know, I was the one that originally came up with that. Um, you know, that sort of thing. But aliens caught wind of all of his stories, not realizing that he was totally just blowing it out of his butt. <laughs> so oh, you can know where this story goes. <laughs> sounds like the plot line of Galaxy Quest. So, a little bit, yeah. A, a teensy bit Galaxy Quest, you're right. But it's it's hilarious how it goes. And then the way he gets out of the situation, I won't spoil it, but it's hilarious. Just look it up sometime. You'll you'll love it to bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember one where <clears throat> the uh, there was a spaceship in the barn and, you know, come to find out, you know, it was a, a spaceship that was about maybe three feet in diameter. Oh, yeah, the tiny feet. ones? Yeah, the tiny ones. Oh, and, yeah. You know, and it was like they they didn't realize that they had, like, landed on a planet of giants or something like that. And, mm. uh, and because the story was actually told from the perspective of what you would think was us. Mm. But I think by the by the time you get to the end of the episode... I think you realize that the us is in the spaceship. Yeah. Because it actually has like the United States um, flag or whatever on the on the spaceship. So mm-hmm. it was cool stories. I mean, it was uh, it was definitely cool stories. Yeah, Serling had that ability to take things that you may have thought of and decided quickly not to think of because that's uncomfortable. We were not, we're not going to focus on that yeah. or stuff that you just never thought of and work them in a way that didn't seem preachy, 
but still was profound, uh -huh. if that makes sense. Uh -huh. So that's that's one of the things I really like about the Twilight Zone, Espe especially, and here's some leanings coming in, but especially any time that they decide to do the stereotypical, let's have Satan show up. <laughs> right? <laughs> I've told you that I have a pet peeve about this because they will set him up as this menacing looking guy with horns on his head and a pitchfork. It's like, no, dude, <laughs> that's not how I see that. But but the Twilight Zone always had him as this slick, smooth talking. I'm going to trick you into a deal right now, and there's no way you're going to get out of it either. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, That's always how I saw that character, I suppose we'll put it. But so the way the Twilight Zone always did it was a lot better than the, oh, come on, you're just being ridiculous now. <laughs> yeah, it it. It reminds me of of one of our new favorite shows, Lucifer, mm. uh, because that's pretty much the way he is. Is he's very debonair and uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, you need to just watch that show just for the 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 storyline. You know, completely forget the whole religious aspects of it. But right, because uh, it is based on a comic book, and and mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, what if Satan decided he's had enough of hell? And he's going to go have some fun. So he goes to mm -hmm. L.A. and runs a seems nightclub. Like, seems like the appropriate place to go. <laughs> right, right. And then I'm you. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, L.A., hell, very similar. But, <laughs> you know, and then you have an angel who's coming down to try to get him to go back into his rightful place because there's this balance that must be maintained. Mm. Uh and so, yeah, it's it's a really good show. I encourage anybody who has not watched it, don't let the name, you know, turn you off and say, oh, no, if I watch this, then I'm a devil worshiper. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, it's 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 good, innocent fun. I mean. It's it, like it, me, wait, I'm just waiting for a backlash, and I, I really hope this backlash doesn't happen. But um, I've been watching it. It's, it's, your, it's your fault. <laughs> but, no, you— you told me about its existence. Um, Morgan Freeman is doing this really fascinating oh, yeah. show on the History Channel called The Story of God. And I'm just waiting for someone to backlash and me go, no, shut up. <laughs> just shut up. Yeah, we actually turned that on last night as we were going to bed. And uh, I think it was the third episode was, mm -hmm. was like replaying at 11 o'clock last night. Yeah, I'm gonna, at some point, I'm going to have to sit episode. down. Yeah, I'm gonna have to sit down and and once they've done them all and just watch them all in their entirety. Um, yeah, because they're fascinating and they're really well done. It's not coming from the angle of either someone that believes any specific religion or someone that doesn't believe yeah. any specific religion. It's it's really. Fa I mean, me and you, we've we've got a atheist and a Christian, and both of us like the show. That should give you some indication. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Of how fair and balanced this show actually is. If you you're, know, I mean, if you've got any curiosity, you know, even if it's just from the viewpoint of how how have we arrived today to where we have such diverse beliefs, and how can mm -hmm. certain individuals believe one way and other individuals believe another? To me, that's what is what he's attempting to figure out. Yeah, and, totally. And so it's I, I don't fascinating. have. Yeah, I, I like that kind of stuff. So. Mm. All right, well, um, I think that's it. That's all we've got on the docket today. Yeah. So um, you got anything you uh, you want to plug? Doing anything special this week? Well, today at some point, probably after this, I am going to publish the latest Samuel's Thoughts because I had published it and wasn't late, and then five minutes into the recording it went silent, so I kind of had to replace it. <laughs> and so. you checked it this time, right? I I am a, I am going to check it this time just to make sure. <laughs> I'm still halfway through the process before we had to do this show. I okay. recorded it before we came into this. So yeah, I am going to check it this time to make sure. It's uh, just one of those things. But anyway, that can be found at tscn.tv slash st for Samuel's thoughts. I actually get to answer my first listener question in which someone asked me, for some reason, they wanted my opinion in this argument, but they were having an argument with someone, and they asked me my opinion on whether or not you should have a friend of the opposite sex while you're in a relationship. So it, it became a nice little 
apparently became Dr. Love for a second. I don't know why, <laughs> but still, they asked my opinion, so I gave it. So, yeah, that'll be there. And if you want to find me on social media, you can go to about.me slash labtech7 for all the links to get to me there. All right, good deal. Uh, everything I'm doing is over at slant.fm, and social media stuff is about.me slash gdadkissin. We do try to do this show every Monday through Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. It is a call-in show, so we would greatly appreciate it if you'd call in and give us your opinion on anything that we're talking about, you know, during the show that we're doing, or you want to talk about a previous show that we did, topic we talked about, agree, disagree, just let's have that conversation. And, of course, that number is 229-518-3525. But don't call it unless we're actually doing the show. It won't do you any good. It'll just ring, 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 ring. So, <laughs> All right, so we'll be back tomorrow uh, for another uh, edition of Wide Open Talk Show. Until then, everybody, have a good afternoon and a good Tuesday morning. Take care. Bye-bye. show is a production of the Slant FM Digital Network. Find more at slant.fm.